Uh, we're going to call the school committee meeting to order. It is Thursday, November 17th. This meeting is being recorded by WCTV and Jamie Wixton. Uh, would everyone please stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome. First up on our agenda tonight is, is good news, and this is great when we can um, recognize students. I'm going to ask Mr. Palladino to help out here in a second. Uh, and the students that were eligible for this had to score in the advanced category on one of three high school state assessments in English, language arts, mathematics, or science, technology, and engineering, and then score proficient or advanced in the other two. And they also had to have a combined MCAT score that put them in the top 25% of their class. So it is with great pleasure that we welcome and recognize the students that have achieved this honor. Mr. Palladino. <coughs> Thank you, and uh, thank you for that description. You just saved me a few minutes of, <laughs> of reading the same thing, so thank you for that. And, and I think it's important to note, <coughs> these are some of our best and brightest from the senior class, class of 2023, and I, and I also want to mention that this could equate to as much as $8,000 over their career should they choose to attend a public college or university. So we are very excited. To recognize all of them, I'm going to read every name if you don't mind. Sure. We have quite a few students that are at work or studying, but we do have a, a good percentage of them here today. So I do want to call them up, and I'm going to ask them to stand behind me if that's okay. Sure. And then I will get them their certificates. Great. So our first recipient, Armin Arujo. <laughs> Amos Braley. Alexandra Bumpus, Elijah Carrion, Joseph Clements, Laura Clements, Olivia Ellis, Autumn Francis, Kissimmee Georges, James Houghton, Jessica Janik, Ala Kalini, Marianne Karam, Salim Karam, Ala Kimmel, Sally Morrell, Jordan Morrell, James Pinkham, Frederick Rosen, Isabella Russo, Gabriel Silva, Peyton Smith, Robert Spear, Wendy Soot, Desmond Swartz Sobrowski, Dylan Tilton, Indiana Troop, and Dylan Turner. I believe you'll be hearing these names quite a bit over the next few months, and I just want to personally congratulate you one more time. And we do have the certificates we promised you, so stand by, I'll get those to you.
think she's introducing you too. Oh, oh, oh isn't that? Isn't that? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> just watch it out. Oh boy. Now I've got it right. I'm coming to me, so it's, 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 all, it's all good. Vincent's <laughs> eighth grade, so. <laughs> And, and don't go anywhere yet, P folks. A couple of questions, I think, from the committee. Um, Mr. Sweat, I will let you. Whenever Mr. Palladino is ready. Did I, did I get everyone? No, okay. Dylan. Great. Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 you got me fired. Thank you, Dylan. <laughs> 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 hold it up. No, they're not. They didn't stay in alphabetical order. <laughs> Dylan, hold it up. Don't have that. Mr. Sweat, your question. So, there's an official. Uh, they love questions, so ask them as many as you want. Okay. Okay, the first one is a, uh, you don't need to grab a microphone, uh, because the first one is by a show of hands, how many of you expect to take advantage of this scholarship? One, two, three, five, four. Okay, and would anybody like to tell me, if they're not planning to take advantage of this, what is the, bi what is the biggest reason uh, associated with not doing it? Kiss me. Microphone. You gotta come up, kiss me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't raise her hand. <laughs> K kiss me is one of our wonderful tennis players. <laughs> I carried the team. <laughs> I, the only reason I would not be taking advantage of this is because I plan on going to a school that does not give, well, this scholarship does not apply to, which my top school does, this scholarship does not apply to it, so it's probably the only reason. So this would have been a, potentially would have been a factor, uh, except that they didn't have what you wanted from the perspective of courses, et cetera. Is that a fair statement? Um, not necessarily. I this just my <laughs> not necessarily, honestly. I I don't think that I will end up going to a school that this scholarship applies to, even though I'm very proud and you should be of very proud it. of it. Yes. Because the UMass system is a wonderful system for education. Okay. I believe well, that. Well thank you for getting in front of the microphone. Of course. Anytime. Does anybody else want to talk about why they wouldn't take advantage of it? Please. Um, I'm not applying to like any like public schools in Massachusetts, and like only like just like private schools and like out of state schools. So they wouldn't like work out. Like it's only for like in state schools. So. That's so is not. that because they're too close to home? <laughs> <laughs> I mean a little, but at the same time like. I'm only applying, yeah, that's the reason. <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> I'm applying to a few in Massachusetts, but most of them are out of state. Got it. Thank you. I would add, too, that I think this, this scholarship has come to be recognized by a lot of private schools in Massachusetts and also out of state schools in terms of like the rigor that was required to get the scholarship. And even if it doesn't necessarily amount to a financial discount, it still is something we can add to our applications that we haven't submitted yet um, as an award that we received. So it's still, and a lot of colleges know what it is and have come to know what the scholarship is. Um, and you told us about that. So I think um, even if we're not going to a state school, it definitely will help us and we're all very proud. And, and maybe indirectly helps you get merit scholarship out exactly. of it. Exactly. Well, congratulations again for sure, and I just want to say uh, you, you did a great job. Don't rest on your laurels. You still have almost three quarters of a senior year going forward, and so keep working as hard as you worked earlier in your careers. That's great. Congratulations. Good job. You do not have to stay for the rest of the meeting. I'm going to stay here all night. Congratulations, everyone. I don't get this study. He wants to talk twice as Montserrat and Beverly. No. Montserrat and Beverly. But Nassar is number two, and that's a state school, so. <coughs> You 
don't want to stay. <laughs> That's uh, before we move on to our student report, I did want to have a moment of silence for two Wareham educators who passed away recently. Uh, there was Pat Cullen, who was a longtime sixth grade middle school teacher. Uh, the actual gymnasium is named after her because she was such a great Celtics fan. And uh, Mr. Bob Casey, who was a longtime guidance counselor, my guidance counselor in high school, family friend as well. And uh, if we could just have a moment of silence for these two dedicated educators. Thank you. Do we still have good news? Yeah. There's still other good news? Are we still covering that? Or are we going to <coughs> um, We can do it. We can have more good news if we have it. <laughs> All right. Um, April is asked to express a couple more uh, good news items before we move on to Indy's report. I just wanted to thank um, Josh Anagiogu for coming to the high school and the middle school today to talk to the students about, uh, as a former um, Wareham High School alumni who fought really hard to get what he wanted and worked really hard. So it was, I think, a great opportunity for the kids to see that, especially those who are, want to pursue a career in athletics, that a D1 school isn't necessary, and hard work and determination coming from Wareham Public Schools did, and coming up through all the programs that the town has to offer. So I'd just like to recognize that as a good news for the kids today. Thank you. Any last? Jeff? Um, I would love for the girls volleyball team to be recognized. Not only uh, did they have lots of victories this year as compared to prior years, um, they also excited um, the student body and the staff and the community by actually winning a playoff game. And the only reason they're not in the playoffs anymore is they actually had to play after winning a playoff game, they ended up playing the top seeded team and they did very well against the top seeded team, a very competitive match. So um, congratulations to the girls volleyball team. Thank you. Thanks. Joyce? Um, I feel like it's been a while since we've shared good news. So town meeting seems like it was a while ago, <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the voters um, at town meeting for supporting the two projects, the boilers at the high school and the roof at the middle school. Um, and thank you to the superintendent and the finance director for working with the town to behind the scenes to make that happen. Um, also, I wanted to say I got to the opportunity to go to the elementary school to the pumpkin walk, and I was blown away by the creativity. It was just unbelievable. I'm, I'm so glad that, that I went. I got so many ideas that <laughs> <laughs> for next year's pumpkin. It was just amazing, amazing. Um, and then the last thing is tomorrow, um, I was invited, because I'm a member of the board of the Cape Cod Collaborative, to a ceremony at Mass Maritime, because they are the um, recipient of a grant from the GE Foundation that Mass Maritime is going to share with the ASLP um, attendees this coming year. And so they, there'll be more financial aid available and I'm such a big fan of ASLP at Mass Maritime. It's such a great program. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding that they have broadened the requirements so that more students will be eligible. And Wareham will have, I think they said 18 spots this year. And the best part is that there is a lot of financial aid available to students. Um, it seems like there's more and more all the time. So I'm really excited to go tomorrow and represent Wareham and Cape Cod Collaborative That's at Mass great Maritime. News. It is. I know, Jeff, you've been a supporter of ASLP too, yeah. And that's it, thank you. Thank you. All right, we move on to uh, Indy and the student representative report. All right, thank you. Um, it has been a very busy month, and I also feel like I, we haven't reported for a while, so. It's like a long list, right? There's a good amount to go through, so I'll try to get through it quick. Um, we'll start with the Powder Puff game. Um, our annual ORR versus Wareham Powder Puff game is at home this year. Um, so we have seniors and juniors, uh, both girls and boys participating, um, and the boys are cheerleaders this year. Um, and I have to thank uh, April for her work with that. She is the coach of the cheerleading team. So uh, we're, we're super excited. And, maker uh, of the tutus for yeah, the cheerleading team. Yeah, maker of the tutus. 
<laughs> so I don't know if I'm excited to wear the tutu, but I'm excited, oh, you are. <laughs> I'm excited you are. <laughs> for the event. <laughs> Your leaders are all about excitement. <laughs> so um, that will be at 1 p.m. at Spillane Field, and tickets are $5 for that. Um, there's going to be raffles, um, different things like that, and that is to support. Um, it's actually a fundraiser for both Wareham and Old Rochester. So. Um, Please come if you can. What was the date? That, that, oh, sorry. <laughs> Next Wednesday, uh, November 23rd. So the, it's the day right before our break um, at 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Okay. 1 p.m., yep. Um, all right. Uh, the Viking Theater Company is performing their fall play or winter play, um, She Kills Monster or Monsters. That is December 9th, 10th, and 11th, and tickets can be bought at the door for that. Um, the DECA Craft Fair, our first annual craft fair, will be this Saturday from 11 to 4 p.m. Um, we'll have concessions, raffles, uh, tons of activities throughout the day. Um, so please come to that if you can. That's at the high school gymnasium from 11 to 4 this Saturday the 19th. Um, I'm going to steal a little bit of Mr. Palladino's thunder here, but we've had um, amazing people from NEASC from the, for the past few days in our school um, and they were there for a majority of this week doing evaluations um, and I, I mean they were first great people that were very interactive with the students um, and you could tell that they are familiar with the school environment because they really would talk to students even if they were walking by them in the halls and um, but we also had opportunities to talk to them on Tuesday. They actually brought a bunch of students, um, a huge group of students, um, to talk to them about our school and the school culture and stuff like that. Um, and on Monday, um, I was able to give half of the evaluators a tour of our school. Um, and overall, I know they met with the faculty um, at the end of their visit and said how impressed they were. Um, and I'll leave the rest to Mr. Palladino to cover at some point in the future. But yeah. Uh, so senior dues um, are a hot topic um, uh, among students. It's a $150 cost um, typically, or has been for the past few years. And I just wanted to give a huge thank you to Mr. Palladino um, for helping us bring those dues down to $125 this year. Um, and even though $25 doesn't seem like a huge amount, it really does make a difference for students that um, don't have $125 or $150 to throw out of their own pocket. Um, so, and those are the kids that also are fundraising um, as much as they can. And we, we do offer fundraisers for them to cover that cost and different things to cover that cost. But 125 the $25 does make a huge difference to a lot of kids. So thank you, Mr. Palladino, for your help with that. Um, the senior class is doing a Cupcake Charlie's fundraiser. So we're selling cupcakes. Um, and that is one of the fundraisers to help with our senior dues. So anyone can see a senior to purchase those. Um, the price is $20. And for that $20, you get six cupcakes and lots of different flavor options. So find a senior if you're interested in that. And then um, let's see. Today, I had the pleasure to attend our State Student Advisory Council meeting. And I love, I love going to these. I, th I think I say this every time. We were at Worcester Technical High School today. First off, amazing high school um, and uh, just really huge. <laughs> it was a lot different than Wareham. But, um, it was, it, it was an amazing meeting. I went with uh, Marianne Karam, who was just here, and Olivia Hogan, our two other uh, delegates for that. Um, and we just have really, really great conversations every time. And it's always nice to brag about your school and um, have people receive that really well. So um, that's always a pleasure. And it was, it was a great meeting. Um, and then also a couple, I think it was two Saturdays ago, um, I was able to attend the Massachusetts Association of School Committee's annual meeting um, on the last day there and had lunch with some school committee members from across the state. Um, and that, again, was just an awesome experience. And I also learned that we, we are very ahead of the curve in terms of our student voice and agency here. Um, and I've, I think that's thanks to our administration and Dr. Schwamm and Dr. DeAndrea and also our school committee really, and our administrators at the school level really putting student voice at the forefront. But I mean, some school committees don't even have student representatives and despite it being a law. Um, so 
really proud to be a student here, and that, that conference really made me realize that. So, um, and in the future, um, and as if I don't have time already, I am going to different school committees um, with other members of our team at the Association of Student Reps um, and talking to boards without student representatives about the importance of having them on the committee and having student advisory committees. There is a huge chunk that don't. Um, so I'm really excited to work to um, get that done this year. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Indy. If you have any questions, feel free. But. Thanks, Indy. Well, I have a question about the cupcakes. Please. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is there one more big game of the year? Yes, yeah. Um, our, sure our Thanksgiving football, <laughs> yeah, our Thanksgiving football game is, of course, on Thanksgiving. It's at home this year? No, it's at Bourne at yeah. 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. on Thanksgiving, so. Not that you're vested. <laughs> Not at all. Not that it's my child's last football game ever, <laughs> so. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely go to that if you can. Thank you, Andy. Nice job. Thank you. And there were a lot of other school committee people at that conference bragging about how amazing they thought Indiana did in his presentation. I wasn't able to go to his session, but um, I did get a lot of messages from other colleagues after the fact on how great of a job he did representing all the students and how articulate he was, so. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, item number four on the agenda is the bus driver's contract. That has been tabled uh, until our next meeting on December 1st. We're looking for some language clarification and hope to go forward with the vote on our next meeting. And that brings us to number five, budget transfers. And Kristen Flynn. <coughs> Good evening. I have a few, I have two budget transfers for your consideration tonight. Um, one is a familiar one. I was here a few weeks ago, a few months ago, to uh, ask for a budget transfer for the Wareham Elementary School electricity account. And I think, I believe at the time I mentioned that it would be, I just wanted to fund it for a few months and then see where we, we were at a few months later. So um, here I am asking for a budget transfer for the Wareham Elementary School electric account. I do have some good news. The um, expenditures have seemed to moderate some more from the last time I came to speak to you. Um, the October, the invoice we received in October was 46,000. Uh, it was down from uh, 57,000 in September, and the one we received in November was approximately 22,000. So we're heading in the right direction. So, and I know that um, Mr. Trahan, the director of facilities, is closely watching this. We spoke today about it, and he um, is making sure that the temperature set points are set properly and consistently. So he is definitely um, concerned and in, in watching this. So, with that said, um, I would ask that we do a budget transfer so that we can um, continue to, to pay the in invoices. So I'm asking for a transfer into the uh, Wareham Elementary School utilities account. That's where the electric comes out in addition to um, all utilities other than heat of $40,000. And the accounts are listed on your sheet where I'm requesting that they're coming from. I took a look at some of the um, equipment contract services, equipment repairs, building maintenance contract services and maintenance supplies, and did small transfers of 5,000 from each from the Wareham Elementary School accounts. The thought process is, is that where this is a new school, that hopefully those, um, those lines will not need to be, to be tapped. And then the other part of it is coming from the high school utilities, which appears to have um, more than enough to get us through as long as things stay pretty much the same. So at this point in time, I'm just asking for a transfer of $40,000 in the Wareham Elementary School Utilities account, and I'm hoping this will get us through um, January and February, perhaps. Do I have a motion to accept that transfer? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? Jeff? So, as Dr. Chandler turned on the heat, That's a no. <laughs> I'm aware of no. It's a no. Is Dr. Chandler willing to turn off the lights? <laughs> Is there motion controlled? Um, <laughs> but yes. Good. Glad to hear that. <laughs> has has Mr. Palladino approved twenty thousand coming from <laughs> from his budget 
And I ex must say, given what's happened with utilities, I'm shocked that he has 20,000 to donate to the, to the elementary school. Um, with the, in the Wareham, El Wareham High School budget, the revised budget in utilities, the revised balance after the transfer is still around 192,000. And we've already made an encumbrance for what we anticipate the year to be. So there is, I, I believe at this point, there is still some, some room there. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, uh, so we had a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Five zero zero. Thank you. Thank you. And the second transfer request that I have for you tonight is into um, student services, home instruction for special education. This is our tutoring line um, for contract services for special education tutoring. We have a contract with a new tutoring company, FEV Tutoring, um, which uh, the Director of Student Services has, has sought out and is actually, um, in her opinion, going to be less costly for this service. However, um, there is a lot of, of student services uh, home instruction that has been required, uh, perhaps since the pandemic as well, with students not attending school and needing to be educated at home. So I'm requesting to, um, to transfer for funds into that account. And you'll also see that I included um, the, a deficit account that we had ESY para salaries. The accounts that I'm looking to transfer from are the ESY, the extended school, the summer school program, teaching services into those accounts because that summer school program has ended and that is funds that are, are and continue to be available. So that being said, I'm just looking for a transfer of $20,000 into home instruction and 13,489 into ESY para, para salaries to clear the deficit. And that's coming from the teacher services extended day, the ESY teaching services. Do we have a motion to accept that transfer? So moved. Second. All right, discussion, questions, Jeff? So, curiously enough, I was once home tutored when I broke my leg. I did not have an IEP, although I'm not even sure they had IEPs in the 1800s. But in any event, could you give us an example of the kind of student who is not obviously homeschooled, because mm -hmm. that, I assume, is not part of this line item. Uh, could you give us an example of, of someone who is, receives instruction at home? Well, I'm going to defer to um, my principals here to answer that, but in general, it may be a student who might be out of school or in the hospital um, that is not able to attend school in person that still requires educational services. And there's a, a specific form that doctors need to fill out. So the Massachusetts Department of Education has a form, um, and that tells... Yeah, <laughs> and that specific form is required. Once the doctor fills it out, we're on the docket for it. Understood. Um, and it could be a child that is hospitalized. Um, we have a child at the um, middle school that has had surgery and is unable to get out of bed. Um, they're working on <laughs> getting her to that point, but she's been out since the first day of school. So this has, so, so even though it's marked Sped. It doesn't mean that it's a special ed student or a 504 student. It's any student that's medically incapable of coming to school. That makes perfect sense. I was one of those kids um, a, a, a zillion mm -hmm. years ago. So it's Mark Sped on the line item. Is that? We have two line items. One is for special education and one is for uh, regular education students. So this is the special education student line. That this student would, happens to be a special correct, student, yes. but they might not be. Correct. Exactly. There's two different. There's two different types, and it's it's just we um, break it out for reporting to the Department of Education because we have to report our instructional costs for regular day and for special education. Yeah, I asked this, and thank you for that explanation. You, it was just for my edification, <laughs> not because I intend to vote against this. And I guess the last question: I'm shocked that there was thirty-three thousand dollars left out of a $56,000 budget, not holding you accountable or you accountable for that, but that just seems like a huge disparity. Um, I'm grateful it was available, but never mind. You don't need to comment. I'm all set, Mr. Chair. 
Any other questions or comments? Joyce. So my question just goes along with that. So ESY, I, I understand, is summer. Mm -hmm. Ex yes. An extended day is also the summer program? I think it's the same. I, I think so I was using it interchangeably. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Or extended school year. Extended school year. Summer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All in favor of accepting this transfer? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Five zero zero. All right, next up, we're discussing the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 report. Yes. Okay, well, in your packet, you have the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 reports. So uh, what I've done is I took the ESSER um, grants and put them onto a spreadsheet that I hoped was, would be easier to read, not only for myself, but for, also, for you also. So I'm not sure how, um, how familiar you are with the grants and how they're applied for. Um, but basically, for every Department of Ed grant, we have to submit an application, an online submission, and there's a lot of information that goes into it. And part of it is the budget, and this is what you have in front of you is, is the budget for SR2 and SR3. The Department of Education reviews it and either approves it or says, you know, you need to do something else, uh, come back to us when you've changed it. So what you have is the approved budget for SR2 and SR3. Um, they, the grants, as we've discussed before, can be amended if you find that you need to make a change. If, um, for example, um, you thought that you were going to need something in uh, instructional uh, teachers' professional salaries, but you ended up using um, paraprofessionals for whatever activity that you were going to do, you would do an amendment. Or if you, um, in, in one of the grants, if you had mentors for new teachers and all of a sudden you had a lot of teachers resign in, during the summer and you had more new teachers, then you would have to put more money into mentor teaching stipends. So those are some examples of, of some amendments. I know we talked a little bit about those. So here in ESSER 2, um, prior to, uh, Prior to June, prior to June 1st, the grant had been expended, and uh, many of the lines had been over expended uh, from what was in in the budget. So, and the grant in in the salaries line had been over expended. There are some other there are some funds in other lines, um, but in the salary lines, they had been over expended. So uh, over the summer, I took a look at it, and in the early fall, we had to charge some expenditures that had been overexpended in ESSER 2 to ESSER 3. So on your spreadsheet, you'll see to the, to the right-hand side, you'll see expended in FY22. And that's what was expended through uh, probably the payroll in FY22 for all the accounts on the left-hand side. You can see in ESSER 2, um, in instructional professional staff salaries, guidance counselors, teachers, psychological service providers, and medical services. And each grant has different categories. I should have started with that. So you have your instructional salaries, you have support staff salaries, here you have fringe benefits, which is the retirement contribution for those salaries. In this, you'll have contract services, supplies and materials, and other, and maybe some other um, accounts, but this is what we have in SR2. So the first thing that needed to be done is we had to do a journal entry to take those over expenditures from FY22 and move them into SR3 because we had exhausted um, SR2 for salaries. So that's that second column you see. So that's sort of writing, writing the ship for that. So what that meant is we spent all of SR2 for salaries and then we were already into SR3. So now, um, the year starts, and in some salaries we weren't, but some salaries we were. So we had to, I had to, what I attempted to do was match the, the budget, the Department of Ed approved budget for, for SR2 to our, match our expenditures to the approved budget. And that had to be accomplished by moving it to SR3. It was sort of a two-pronged approach because then we had to take a look at SR3 and make sure that what we were doing matched or closely followed what had been <clears throat> what had been approved in SR3. So it was it was sort of a, a puzzle piece. So that being said, you can see what's been expended in the um, expended FY22 column for FY SR2. The journal entry that was done to match up the major categories, the major category being instructional and professional staff salaries, support staff, fringe supplies. You can um, 
go over and under within those categories, but once you go over in, in total in the major category, like uh, instructional salaries, by more than 10%, you have to do an amendment. So that's, where all the, that's how that all fits in. So you can see um, the SR2 right now, the salaries uh, for the most part have been expended. And what we have left is we do have an encumbrance for the fringe benefits. When you close out the grant, you pay MTRS for the, um, the retirement costs for those salaries and you pay the county retirement or you, for the cost of the um, salaries that are applicable to the county retirement. So what we have left in SR2 is contract services. It's on the second page. And when I looked at the application for SR2 under contract services, you have to say, okay, what are we going to do with these contract services? So here, this was instructional services, um, services to assist learning loss for a flat 50,000, and contract services provided other student services also for learning loss. So there's 60,000 left in SR2 for contract services that we did not touch because that wasn't part of the whole salary balancing that we had to do. Additionally, the, um, in supplies and materials, you can <coughs> see that originally 274,907 was budgeted, was approved for supplies and materials. There has been um, and, uh, just under 218,000 in spending for that, leaving, uh, leaving some, actually we, we've, and we've encumbered some for some devices, so we've fully, expent, fully spent the supplies line. So we bought, I believe we bought some Chromebooks this year with that. And then we do have some funds in classroom supplies and a small amount of funds in facility supplies. So there is just uh, all told in SR2, $83,579.92. And a good portion of that is the retirement portion. Well, that's actually, that's already uncumbered for. So that's what remains is 83,580 in SR2. Now, similarly, in SR3, we, an application was made, and it was mostly for salaries. So now, as I mentioned, we had to take those over expenditures from SR2 and apply them to SR3, so we wouldn't have a deficit in SR2 because we can't, we can't have that. Um, so that's what we started the year with in SR3, and we are continuing to charge uh, salaries to SR3 as, as time goes on. So I also included a sheet um, in SR3. Now SR3, you can see what has been uh, applied for and approved by the Department of Ed is instructional and professional staff salaries. Under that category is guidance and adjustment counselors, classroom teachers and coaches, psychological service providers, and medical services. Under support staff salaries is facility support workers, custodians, and um, uh, building maintenance salaries. There's also technology support salaries for all of our technicians in the three buildings. The associated um, fringe benefits, the MTRS in the Ply Plymouth County and a small amount for um, supplies and materials for instructional technology. So that's SR3. Um, and as I mentioned, as you, go, as you go along, sometimes you do have to find that you monitor your expenditures and you have to adjust your grant if, if need be. So with that being said, and I also included a sheet of all of the, the salaries that are coming out of SR, because that's the, the majority of, of what we are charging to the ESSER grants. So you can see that the last page, I believe, um, there's three technology support staff, six teachers, uh, two medical and therapeutic, one paraprofessional, five guidance and adjustment counselors, a psychologist, three custodians, and three maintenance workers. And that's the total staff currently being charged to ESSER three. So you can see some of their salary is funded by SR2 in the lines that had funds in SR2, and some of the, sal the majority of the salary is funded now in SR3 for this year. And then, um, then we'll have what, what might remain at the end of the year, hopefully what remains. Dr. Schwann? So these, um, these salaries that are coming from the grants, we, all grants we have to count 9% um, benefits for both um, para secretaries and professional staff 
So that money is there to pay the benefits? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, is, that, is that considered in that other amount of money that we have allocated, or is that different for the 400,000 that's in there for um, FY24 expenditure to the town? Is that a separate that's cost? That's separate, yes, yes. The, okay. the benefits cost to the town? That, yes, yes. yes. That's, that is separate. This is what is um, the cost to the town. Yes, the okay. cost of the town is health benefits. The cost here is their MTRS or their Plymouth County, as Dr. Schwamm said. And that's standard across all grants. When you're using, when you're applying for salaries, you have to, you have to include the retirement for those salaries if they're if they're eligible for retirement. Just curious, who is responsible for those benefits when they're not connected to the grant? Is it the school or is it the town? Um, which benefit? The retirement benefit. Who is when they're not con oh when they're not connected to the grant? So. Yes. Um, those of us in MTRS are fully funding our retirement through our payroll deduction, so there's not a match. In uh, Plymouth County or in the non-MTRS, it is an assessment to the town um, by Plymouth County for those members, so your custodians, food service, paras, uh, secretaries. Drivers, secretaries, for those for those <coughs> staff members. Um, so, but the grant in, in, in grants, you are, it's mandatory that you reserve those funds for those for that retirement so uh, Brennan well, actually I was just wondering with the salaries charged to assert it says there's 24 now could is there any more would be added later I don't quite understand how it works like mm -hmm. would we anticipate more salaries being needed to be added to this or how does that work um I would say if there needs to be more of an offset from ESSER for next year's budget, then that is that is a possibility. Um, right now, what what I did, what uh, we did is we we just left it as as it was. So we tried to replicate what had been applied for and continue it. And then as we go through this year, as we go through this year's budget, you know, we're hoping that we're not going to need to rely any more on ESSER than we already are, but that is a consideration. How is it decided which salaries would be added? Um, at the time that the grant was applied for, uh, whoever was applying for the grant would have um, filled out the workbook and would have said, I, I need to, I'm going to um, charge these types of salaries. So for example, um, it would say in instructional professional staff, medical therapeutic services, therapists, or they might say, I'm, I need to use classroom teachers, or I'd like to hire some guidance or adjustment counselors to help with the a, with a social emotional learning for the pandemic. So I'm going to add some guidance and school adjustment counselors to my staff, and I'm going to pay for them, you know, for the time being through, through ESSER or a psychological service provider. Or you may have a grant that, um, you know, we recently, received for some indoor air quality. So we might say, well, we need to hire or pay for a, um, you know, an HVAC technician through that grant. So it really all depends. So you really have to have a coordinated effort and, and know, um, you know, what positions you have, what positions you need, what you're trying to do. The grants managers, I believe, work together. There's several different staff members that manage different grants, Dr. Schwamm being one of them. Um, so I think, you know, in some cases, we all work together to try to figure out how to fund the priorities that we have. I can't speak specifically to, to what um, the thought process was for this, um, but in, in general, that's what I've seen happening. Thank you. With grants. Mm -hmm. Jeff? Uh, first of all, I would be remiss if I didn't compliment you and Dr. Mm -hmm. DeAndrea. Uh, you have both set a high standard for transparency and clarity uh, with respect to these kinds of things. Uh, I think they, they will benefit not only this committee, but the town uh, as they go through the process of considering our budget. So thank you very much. Um, secondly, I, that's the first time I've ever heard this 9%. Is that a plug number, meaning how accurate is that with respect to the, the dollars you're actually sending to Plymouth County. 
So in the, in the budget, you take 9% of what you've budgeted for, but then once the grant ends, once you've fully expended the grant, you do the final financial report, and you report exactly how much you've spent. And it should be very close or um, not too much over, not too much <coughs> under. So at that point, you take your actual salary spent, multiply it by 9%, and there is, um, in from what DESE does is they will withhold and send directly to MTRS a portion. And then there's a worksheet that you, at the end of the grant, you're responsible for cutting a check for the remainder of what's owed of the 9% of the actual salaries. Now, the 9%, I, I think, must come from the fact that a lot of employees are either contributing at the 9% level. So some employees that here are here in Wareham Public Schools or in the town and other places is they would have come into the retirement system some at 5%, so 5% of their salary gets contributed toward retirement if they got hired a long time ago. I believe it changed to 7 to 8 to 9 and then if there's if you make more than 30,000 there's an adjustment over 30 and then also for those of us in MTRS you can opt if you've been in the system long enough to pay into 11% or you can stay where you entered anyone new coming in pays 11%. So I think that 9% must have been just something that DESE or federal grants settled on and said this is what the um, the percentage of the grants that we, or the percentage of the salary that we need to take from the grants. So the bottom line <clears> is, <throat> it's historically been a pretty good number. There is an ultimately a reconciliation. <laughs> Correct. And that's not a particularly painful one. No, it's Be not. Okay, good. No, it's not. Uh, I'm I'm going to make a statement, and and both you and Dr. DeAndrea can tell me I'm correct, that <laughs> or incorrect. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm correct. Um, there are 24 positions listed here in this sheet. Um, it is accurate to say that <coughs> these are not, in fact, people who are necessarily vulnerable to being out of a job when ESSER ends. That this was a list from the prior administration that is up to Dr. DeAndrea and the principals to decide ultimately what layoffs may or may not have to occur, but it has nothing to do with this list. Is that an accurate statement? I would say that is. I that is an accurate statement, okay. yes. So no one should look at this list and say, oops, I'm a psychologist, you know, I'm necessarily going to be, et cetera. Okay. And I think, too, in, in when you're writing for grants, you have priorities that the Department of Ed sends out, and you have to spend so much money on this, so much money on that, reserve more money for this. So it may have been, obviously, during the pandemic, we wanted to have, um, for example, technology support people to help with all of the, the remote, possible remote technology, all the heavy reliance we have on technology now. Um, you may have needed to hire more nurses um, to do some of the coverage. You may have needed to hire more guidance or adjustment counselors or psychologists. So it may have been, those were probably selected because they best fit the priorities of the grant. Not necessarily because they are um, may or may may be vulnerable, which they're. Two more quick questions. Mm -hmm. One is this is a lot of money. It's a lot. When you look at this um, after the fact, which is to say, you didn't prepare all this stuff. Uh, well, you may have prepared this wonderful spreadsheet, but you didn't apply for these grants, et cetera. Is there? Do you have any concern that? if we were audited with respect to this grant, that we would have any problems whatsoever? Um, looking, I don't know what happened before I came here, but there, there, there could be, yes. There could be some concern, um, especially with, wow. likely with, that, with the journal entries that we had to do because, I mean, the auditors want the transaction to be recorded when it takes place. So the, the, the salary should not have gone into deficit. But, you know, that being said, you know, sometimes so at the end of the year, things get charged where there's, where there's money if, there's, if money is running out. So I really, you know, don't have a, a comment on that any further. But um, so, so sometimes, and I know that the auditors do not like to see so many journal entries, so that may be something that 
could be, you know, discussed. Um, but we could, the flip side of that is we could not close SR2 in a deficit. So it was, um, you know, it was the better of the two choices. Understood, but I would appreciate being kept informed mm -hmm. if, A, if an audit occurs or if you uncover something about which we should be aware so we're not surprised if that occurs. Um, and, and lastly, and I'm probably going to ask you this question maybe every time you're in front of me, um, what is your comfort level about this year's budget and the need to use ESSER funds, th more ESSER funds, than budgeted this year? Um, well, it's a little bit better. We do have um, we do have some funds that we were made aware of with Circuit Breaker. We got some additional funds for transportation. So I was concerned. I was starting to get concerned about that. Um, so we do have right now. We seem to be holding our own with our out of district tuition in transportation. So that's always a concern. Um, the electricity is always a concern. The utilities are a concern. They're I all think turn salaries, off the lights, so right? I think salaries <laughs> right now we're doing okay. Um, one thing that's unpredictable is is sometimes substitutes because you just don't you just don't know how how heavy you're going to need to rely on them. So that's something that will need to be watched. But those are always like the big the big things that you want to watch is your tuitions and your transportation and depending on the year the utilities are depending on the climate you know if it's a bad winter or so would it be putting words in your mouth if I said you were cautiously optimistic I feel better now and we are going to you know so fortunately the um, the special education department and the transportation department worked really hard this summer to identify uh, all of the eligible expenditures expenses for circuit breaker and they really maximized that claim and we have had some some additional expenses and we will be applying for the state's extraordinary relief hopefully and that should help us out even further so so there is as i think i said a, a little bit of breathing room in that regard okay april has the next question so I know that Jeff had alluded to positions and people not necessarily <coughs> thinking that if they're in this category that there's a you know a, t a ticking time bomb for mm -hmm. their for their position. But I do recall when we did vote to have salaries added that there is a chance, obviously after this grant runs its course, that there will be throughout the district the likelihood of layoffs is there. And I just want the town to be aware that when we come to them with a future budget that doesn't have this grant, that we will need to rely on the town if we want to keep our district running to the, to the capacity that it should to attract people to the town and get the support that it needs. So I just wanted to more remind people when it comes to future budget and town meeting that this was a grant because of COVID. Um, and for learning loss and social emotional support. And while it doesn't necessarily mean anyone in particular is going to be, and I know that part of when the previous administration presented things to us, they were, um, there were comments about, you know, the possibility of retirements coming in in, in certain time frames that would kind of offset some of that likelihood. But I just want the town to be aware that this is something we will definitely not have in the future when we are presenting our budget to town meeting and for them to consider how important this this type of staffing has been for our kids and for each school and our district so i just wanted to just make that comment that i want everyone to remember that when it comes to town meeting that this was a special circumstance with this money and it's not it will run out and we will still need the town to support the school choice um, I, I want to repeat what Jeff said, that I really appreciate the, the reports and the work that has gone into being Thank able you. to provide us with this information. I really appreciate that. Um, so if I read this right, right now there's approximately 3.5 million left in ESSER 3. And we're... That's correct. Mm -hmm. And you're predicting 1,860,000 towards net the next budget. Correct. So you've already 
done calculations to get from this number mm -hmm. to that correct. number. Yes. Okay, all right. I just wanted to make sure I was um, reading that correctly. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that, that's my only question. Everything else was answered, thank you. You're welcome. Good. All right, don't go anywhere. <laughs> um, next, we have our FY24 budget presentation. I do want to let the public know that we met last week uh, along with the Finance Committee, many, many members of the Finance Committee, to get a very detail-filled uh, four-hour budget meeting. Uh, that is going to be available very soon on WCTV, so if you want sp very specific details, you can spend four hours watching that show. Um, it's I, I, very exciting. In preparation for this meeting, I did uh, talk to Kristen and Dr. DeAndrea, and uh, we talked about trying to highlight the major points, because there's 60 plus slides. We're not going to go through every single slide in great detail, but some slides will require uh, very focused discussion, and we have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. So, Dr. DeAndrea, take it away. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, first of all, before we, we get into this, I just want to say thank you to the central um, office administrative team for all the work they did to put this together, also the principals and their teams. Um, and we had, as uh, the chair pointed out, we, we met with the FinCom last week and um, presented this, um, this presentation. It is uh, almost six, over 60 slides. Uh, it was a four-hour presentation, but it, I thought it was uh, good information and gave uh, the FinCom some um, opportunities to ask questions and school committee to ask questions. I also want to thank the subcommittee of the school committee for their, um, their assistance on this. Um, so our goals for this budget process has been first and foremost to make sure that the, the schools are properly funded, that we can provide the students with quality education. Uh, we need to maintain our buildings and grounds, uh, make sure our buildings are secure, and to provide transparency to the community um, in how their money is being spent. Um, The presentation is a little bit different from previous years. What we have presented and what the, the, the budget you'll see today is taking um, the FY23, the current budget that we have, all the positions, um, all of the supplies, and moving it into next year and adding in any of the contractual obligations that we have, fixed costs, things of that nature. Um, and it'll be a level service budget. Everything that we have in place this year would be in place next year. Uh, we had to make some assumptions in this budget uh, for natural gas and electric. We bumped up 10% um, at the middle and high school, 20% at the elementary school. Gas and diesel costs up 10%. Out of district placements, for private schools, we had to increase 14%. That is set by the state. Uh, there may be some um, relief on that. Hopefully, there is talk on that at the state level. And the public um, outside, play, outside of, of district placements or collaboratives is a 3% increase. Um, of course, our food service is 100% grant funded. Um, so there's, there is um, only a small piece of that work in here. Um, okay, so the first slide, this is an overview of the budget broken out into the cost centers. So central office, 1.1 million, um, district-wide, 2.4 million, uh, the high school is 9.2, Wareham Middle, 6.6, .6, the elementary school, um, curriculum and assessment, student services, um, the out of district tuition, which is I'm just talk, which is talked about, 3.5 million, uh, transportation costs, 2.7 million, and ELL. Um, so, a level service going into next year, 37 million, um, and and plus some change. Um, that number <coughs> will be offset by grants um, to bring that number down, um, ESSER being one of them. And um, Kristen is going to talk about um, 
this budget and how that number um, is broken out and funded and some of the um, opportunities that we have for grants to, to reduce that a little bit. So I'm going to let her take you through the next few slides. Okay, so this next slide breaks out our major categories of expenses. And you can see what was budgeted in FY23 and what's budgeted in FY24. And both of those are before the offsets that were used to, to balance or to get to the budget numbers that you see. So first off, um, salaries are a major component and you'll see a chart in a little bit as to just how much it is um, of the budget. So all salaries are increasing by 2,053,000. Now this does not include salaries for transportation. It's all other salaries. I included the salaries for transportation under the transportation category since we run our own buses and that's a major expense and also we have some um, you know, vendor transportation. So the salaries you see there in that number, that's all salaries except for the bus drivers, monitors, those salaries, okay? So that increased by um, 2053000 uh, and that's about an 8% increase over FY23. And in budgeting for those salaries, it was everything that was included that makes up a, an employee's salary, which would include their base salary if anyone is moving up a step, moving a lane with a degree, um, if there's any longevity or any other um, portions that they would earn any um, any stipends that they get that may, may be in that, in that portion. Uh, so that's what you see there for salary. So it's looking at the people that we have now and just projecting what their salaries are going to be next year. The next um, con column down is tuition and that's our out of district placements that Dr. DeAndrea just spoke of. So that's private and collaborative tuitions. Now you can see it's increasing by 586,000. So in budgeting for that, what we took a look at was the students that we have in those placements now as of, as of recently and we increased any collaborative tuition by 3% and any private tuition by 5%. I mean, I'm sorry, by 14%. So that's how the number 3.5 million came into play. We also took a look to see if there were any students that were aging out that we knew that we would not be responsible for next year, and they were taken out. So we didn't just take, we took who we have today, who we think are going to be here next year, less any students that may be aging out and then apply the percentages. So that was the tuition um, and that's approximately a overall with the numbers of students and with the, um, with the increases in the, the costs of the tuitions, about a 20% increase. And those numbers are before any contribution from Circuit Breaker, we'll talk about that at the end, and before any offset from the special education grant that we have that we uh, use for tuitions. Okay. Transportation, um, you can see, as I mentioned, it includes salaries in that. In those salaries, we are hoping to hire more drivers so that we can do some of our, more of our runs in-house. We have hired a few new drivers and that I think that the hope is to hire five. So that was included. So as we get you know, more on in time, we might need to adjust that up or down. We may need to adjust the contract services for transportation up or down based on where we think we are with drivers versus um, outsourced vendors. So also included in transportation is fuel costs, any equipment, uh, parts. We have an aging fleet, so we are looking at um, more parts costs uh, in that regard. So that's included in transportation. Um, and also the big bulk of it is our contract services for transportation, which would be the um, drivers that we have that we don't employ, but that we have to go out and get for our out of district to our collaborative and private placements, our homeless transportation and our foster transportation. So anything that we cannot handle in house is also included under vendor transportation. And that can be quite costly. I mean, we're seeing some routes of $400 a day. Some routes are less than that, about $100 a day. Some routes are 300. So it's all over the place, depending, you know, where the student is going really um, and what is available. So the more we can do ourselves, obviously the better and that's the goal. Um, 
So that's what you see in transportation. Um, like I said, the biggest increase is probably through those additional driver salaries that we're hoping to have, and also looking at the routes, how, we, how I budgeted for the out-of-district transportation, the vendor transportation, was again, I took a look at who, who we're driving to places now, assumed that we're going to be driving them next year, and applied a small percent for inflation for any inflated costs. So that, that again, that's a number that needs, to be, that needs to be watched and needs to be looked at and possibly adjusted, because um, that, is, that, is that is a very fluid number. Now the next category is utilities. Um, and you might wonder why utilities are going down when we talk about electric. So again, um, what I did to budget for utilities, and that includes telephone, propane, um, electricity, water, all the utilities. So what I took a look at is there are various, there are one, two, three, four, five, there's about eight accounts. Um, and then I took a look at the what was spent in FY22 and looked at and then made a projection based on that for FY24, which included some increases, obviously, for, for rates and um, possible usage. So there were some accounts that when I looked at them, they were not being utilized they were to what they were budgeted. So in that case, for example, um, you heard me talking about the high school utilities earlier. Uh, that was budgeted at a much higher amount last year and so far this year than what we anticipate using. So some of those funds, instead of leaving them in high school, I wanted to put them where they could be better used in the elementary school. So that was, I moved some of that in this year's budget so that hopefully we won't have to come to you for a budget transfer. But there were um, some de decreased heat, uh, heating costs based on past usage, and mostly some of that was the telephone. So some of those small increases, they added up to 21,000, and again, like transportation. And we're budgeting for utilities in the end of September throughout October for possibly 12 to 18 months from now. So again, that's something that um, as we take a look at the budget, that will have to be you know, updated with more current information if, if we have some. Um, as we get more invoices in, as we see what our usage is, and as we see what the prices are doing. So the next um, category is contract services. And again, what I should have mentioned is what I did is I took the budget the school budget is salaries and expenses. Salaries are the major part, like I said, and all these other are your expenses. So the next expense category we have is contract services. Now contract services can be and can encompass a lot. Um, in our budget, we have contract services for legal expenses, audit expenses, copier leases, medical and therapeutic services. If you have to um, get a, um, you know, a, a contract with a, a physical therapist if you don't have one in-house, if you need to contract with a nursing service for ser perhaps some um, substitute nurses, things like that. Um, school physician, we have a lot of technology contract services for our various programs that we use, such as PowerSchool, Droplet, ASOP, Google Education, Sophos, Incident IQ, alert and then also contract services for the athletic trainer so those are some examples of what's in that category because you do see oh, 800,000 or 900 or 800,000 for contract services what is that so that's just kind of um, a good example of the types of things that you would find uh, in contract contracted services now when we look at contracted services we look at again you know how are we doing are there you know knowing that we have these big increases in salaries these big increases in tuition these big increases in transportation if there's areas of the budget that are underutilized that you can mitigate some of these increases with that's what um, you know we sought to do here in contract in contract services so looking at what we will have outstanding for next year you know perhaps some of those copier leases are coming in less money or some of the um, some of the other contract services we have maybe what was budgeted was more than it needed to be so that's why you see a small decrease in contract services the next category is other now these are all um, how we determine this is that you know you take I took a look at what are the major things that schools spend money on and also how things get reported to the Department of Ed and you'll see that in a little bit so sometimes there's an other category that just it's not a salary it's not 
you know, it's not a utility, it's not a contract service, it's not a supply. So what is that? That's a 550,000 for other, what makes up other? So in terms of other, we would have expenses such as professional development expenses, course reimbursements, um, transportation, not home to school transportation, but athletic transportation would qualify as other, um, field trip transportation, things like that would qualify into other. It's not charged in the Department of Ed under a, a specific transportation code. Um, any conferences, travel, athletic officials, um, transportation for athletics, like I said, police detail perhaps for some athletic events or maybe graduations, anything like that um, in technology, Chromebooks, switches, so nothing that's not directly an instructional supply or a contracted service. It's sort of, you know, where, where everything else lives is in other. So that's some, ex some examples of other, you know, living, I didn't want to just say other and say, well, it's a lot of money, Kristen, 550,000, what is that? So that's some other. Um, the next category is operations and maintenance. So as you would imagine, um, that, that did increase. And in operations and maintenance, we have um, custodial supplies, uniforms, building supplies, building, building contract services. Now the contract services for building and facilities are in operations and maintenance. So those contract services up there, you see are more instruction. These are more related to maintaining the building. Say you had to call in an electrician to do some electrical work. Um, that would be an example. If you um, needed to have your fire alarms worked on, that would go in there, contract service in, in operations and maintenance. So there's building supplies, equipment supplies, <clears throat> costs related to the server, to the network, again, to the security of the building. So that's what you're gonna find in operations and, and maintenance. In supplies, it's mostly instructional supplies, office supplies, classroom supplies, HR supplies, supplies for the nurse's office, any textbooks and materials, and any athletic supplies. So anything that wouldn't be considered, um, I would say, a maintenance supply, a transportation supply, would be in your general classroom office um, supplies like that. <clears throat> and finally, we also have a category for insurance. Um, in this category here, there are three accounts. One is for um, the insurance that we need to provide for student athletic insurance, and there's also insurance for employee health insurance. And we've talked about that at, um, at previous meetings. So it's the health insurance that you know, we talked about earlier tonight for the additional employees, and also the health insurance for food service employees that has been part of, that has been part of the school budget, it seems, for, for some time. So that's what you see there, the FY23 budget before any offsets, the FY24 preliminary before any offsets, and so the difference is a three point, almost a $3.4 million between the two. So um, I did mention earlier that I, ha I have some, we have some charts and graphs here to kind of show the budget in a little bit different manner rather than just talking about the line items. So here we have the budget by DESE function code. And I think I've talked about that in some of my monthly reports. So the Department of Ed, we have to report to every year what the school has spent their money on, what we've received our money, what we've done with it, and they want you to, everything has a code that gets reported. So anything in instruction has a code, and so you can see all the different ones. So as you can imagine, <clears throat> 66, the majority of this budget is in instruction, as it should be, right? We're a school. So 66% of the FY24 preliminary budget is instruction. The next biggest one is pupil services is 11%. So what's in pupil services? Transportation, um, athletics, anything of that, anything of that nature, um, medical, the nursing and physical uh, physician services are in pupil services. That's how the Department of Ed codes it. And there's, there's a whole um, manual on what to charge where. So it's not something that we determine here in Wareham or any other school department determines, it's determined for us and it's how we report. So that's pupil services. Um, operations and maintenance we talked about. So you're gonna have your building maintenance, your custodial services right in there, some of your leases, um, 
insurance and fixed costs we talked about, that's 2%, so that's our, the insurances we just talked about. Fixed assets, there's a small amount, I mean it registers as basically zero in the big percentage, but for any um, motor vehicle, so there's a small amount in the budget that, for that. Tuition, 9%, that's your out of district tuition, and administration are the costs that you see for the school committee and the superintendent and business offices and the, the central office. So that's, that's how the budget is broken out for that. So again, here's another way to look at our budget. So the whole, the whole 30 plus million dollars, 73% of it is salaries. And again, that does not include um, the transportation salaries, it's, it's everything but, and transportation salaries were included for the purposes of this presentation in 27% expenses. And I would say that that's, that's fairly you know, standard from what, from what I've seen, wherein you know, we need our educators and our, our people to educate our students, so it is pretty typical that you would see you know, the majority, the greater majority of your budget in, in salaries. And then finally, um, this is the slide here that I believe that I just did the presentation off of when I went category by category. Um, so, but this excludes salary. So you see in the previous slide, salaries was a big piece of the pie. And then this is how all of the expenses get broken out. So here, the, the number one expense is tuition. Um, again, our out of district tuition. The second one is transportation. And the third one is utilities. So when you add the three of those together, that 76% of our budget that we are spending on, 76% of the expenditures, I will say, that we're spending on tuition, transportation, and utilities. Um, rounding that out is contract services, operations and maintenance, other um, insurance for 5% and supplies for 4%. So I like to include slides such as this because I think it really shows how little discretionary um, funds there are in the budget because we have 70, uh, what did I say, 73% committed to salaries and of that remaining 27%, we have 71% of that, 76% of that committed to tuition, which we have no control over, transportation, which we have some control over, perhaps, um, because it, we do some work in-house here. Um, utilities, we don't have any control over. And we have some control over contract services, operations and maintenance, other, we have no control over insurance, some control over supplies. So when you look at those discretionary funds or any places that you would, you know, may seek to cut before you were to cut salaries, because that's what I think you try to do is not cut salaries. There's very, very little in the way that in that budget. So I just wanted to make that important point that a lot of our costs are, are fixed and they are um, something that we have, we don't have a lot of control over. So that's, that's this slide here. <clears throat> so finally, um, the budget summary. So taking a look at the FY24 requested budget, what we've been talking about before offsets, you can see that it's $37,893,967. Um, and then we have some, some offsets. So we talked about using ESSER 3 as we used in FY23. Circuit breaker, we're anticipating about a million dollars that we can, we're can we gonna use to offset. And again, circuit breaker is money that the state gives you to help with some of your um, more costly special education expenses. So uh, it sets a minimum of foundation and any costs that you have per child, per student above that foundation, they will reimburse you at a percent, between 70 and 75% typically. Mm -hmm. So obviously the higher, the higher your reimbursement, the more costs you have. So um, it, it's, it's, it's helpful, it certainly is. Um, but to get to that level, you have to see that we, we have an awful lot of expenses to get to that level of reimbursement. Um, I also included, we also included the 240 grant, and that's a federal special education grant, and a good portion of that grant goes to pay for some of those special education tuitions. So circuit breaker, those that special, the tuitions that we talked about, that line item for that, they're going to be hopefully offset by circuit breaker and the 240 grant. 
The next one is the IVAQ grant. That's the new grant that we just um, were awarded for indoor ventilation and air quality. <clears throat> a good portion of it is going to go to do some ventilation improvements, such as the rooftop unit at the high school, some, um, some general repairs on univents and general repairs at, uh, at the high school and middle school and perhaps the elementary school if need be. Um, but there is a portion of that that is going to go to pay for the for an HVAC technician. So that that salary is included in the budget, and this is an offset off of that. So that is, you know, that was very helpful that we received that grant. And finally, um, under school nutrition, the um, school nutrition, it's you're allowed to offset some general fund expenses with school nutrition for those for those. Um, you know, shared expenses or indirect costs. So if you have an employee, the best example would be a custodian that goes to the lunchroom every day for two hours and helps set up, clean up, um, get it ready for the next day. You would be eligible to use school lunch funds, to use federal school lunch funds to offset your local needs for in that manner. But there has to be a relationship. You wouldn't necessarily um, be able to charge the um, the salary of the the music teacher per se to the to the to school nutrition. Um, but you can you know there is some room for some for some cost for helping out. So. The FY24 budget after offsets, $34,438,488. So as compared to FY23, similarly, the budget before the offsets, the revenue offsets to get to the approved budget at town meeting, the approved budget at town meeting for FY23 was $32,015,490. So the offsets for that were Circuit Breaker and ESSER, and that is likely a combination. That was, that was some ESSER 2, very little ESSER 2, and mostly ESSER 3. So that's FY23. So finally, just a little comparison, FY24 requested budget after the offsets versus the FY23 approved budget, and that, again, that was after the offsets is a $2.4 million increase for a percentage increase of about 7.5%. So that's um, what we have for you so far. So, Mr. Chairman, um, so included in your packet was a line item budget mm -hmm. um, and also the entire presentation um, that we gave last, um, last week and then this overview. So. We're happy to um, answer any question uh, that you guys may have or um, any input. I, I just want to be clear that unlike previous years, we have no wish list of items here. We have no, in an ideal world, these would be great additions for our school building. Uh, we kind of recognize the situation we were in financially, I think, and, and really came in in a responsible manner, I believe, in trying to look at a level service budget, which is different from what we've done in past years. Uh, so I just want to be clear to the public on that. Correct. So that's not really a question. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from members of the committee? Brennan? I just had one question on the, um, the tuition uh, line. How many students does that represent? So that is, um, that is, I think, I have that. If you just give me a chance. She just answered for it. She did? Oh, okay. 37. Yep, 37. And that's uh, uh, and private and collaborative, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, but for... For FY24, is that, does that reflect uh, 23 or 24 with the increase to 3.5 million? Does that right. so it's, more students it's at that this, level? Or? The current students we have now, um, and then if there were any students that were aging out, I subtracted those out. And, you know, sometimes, you know, in, in years ago, you might put in a buffer for a few students that you would expect to be coming in, you know, because you always do seem to get some. But it, it, for many, many years, those buffers have had to go away as school budgets get, get tighter, depending on the community. So in, in this case in Wareham, it's the students that we have um, as of today in, um, in out-of-district placements are really probably as of last week or a couple weeks ago when we set the budget with a prediction for what their what the cost of that tuition is going to be and again that's a three percent or a 14 percent increase and then taking off any students that we know won't be there so so, so that number the 3.5 <clears throat> re 
reflects a decrease in the amount, of, uh, an anticipated decrease in the amount of students. So there's a decrease in some students, yes, but there's also an increase in the the cost. Yeah. That, yeah. That, no, I so unfortunately, that, yes. yeah. So and um, so it's it's two pronged. So the yeah. increase. So actually, for the private tuitions, the dollar value decreased because some of those students are aging out. But you would say, well, how did the dollar value of the private tuition decrease, Kristen, if you're telling me the tuition's increasing by 14%, it's because we're losing some students through aging out. Mm -hmm. April? I just wanted to not necessarily ask a question, but again, and I know I've said this in press things, a lot of times when budget presentations are given, it's when everyone's eyes glaze over and it's a lot of stuff that people don't understand. So I really just wanna thank you both and especially Kristen for really breaking down the specifics because not only does it help us as a committee understand, but anybody in the district that is watching our meetings and the transparency that you guys have brought with the budget is, is really appreciated because I feel like I get it better than I've ever gotten it and I've been on the committee a little bit now. So I really appreciate how you break it down and make me feel like I don't, you're not speaking a foreign language because me and numbers are not friends. So thank you. Thank you. I really don't have any questions. I mean, I, I looked at the line item budget and I had a few questions, but I, I realized that it's just you putting expenses in different places, you know, where they weren't before. And, and I appreciate that. So no, I really don't have any questions. Again, just thank you for all of the work that's gone into this. Do you have any questions? So people may be shocked that I don't have any questions. <laughs> wow. The reason is that uh, the chair and I are the beneficiary of spending hours uh, <laughs> with the business manager, excuse me, that's not your title, uh, finance director, is that closer? Yes, but I mean, there's many, many titles for yes, finance so director, I. school business manager, school business administrator, we, we just go by whatever, <laughs> yeah. With our wonderful finance director and our superintendent so I have had all my questions uh, answered. Um, the, I will say for the benefit of the public, uh, this, if you could go back to the offset slide. Um, I, the circuit breaker is a recurring benefit to the, to the district. It may not always be a million dollars, it might be more, it might be less, as, as our finance director said, it's a good news, bad news story because you have to spend a lot of money to get the money. Um, the 240 grant is maybe a one-time grant, uh, maybe yeah, not. It, that will, that's pretty, it's one of our entitlement grants. So unless, you know, the federal grants really undergo a change or something really I different trust happens. The government, but so that, okay. you know, the Give level you may go up and down, but, You'll True. probably be seeing that in years yeah. to come. But I remember Title I being twice what it is mm -hmm. today, so I, I worry about the federal right. government, mm -hmm. perhaps especially, no, I won't say that. Um, the IVAC grant is small, it's the school and, the, and that seems specifically COVID related, it's ventilation and all that kind of stuff. And that is a, is a one-time grant, that was 400 and some odd thousand, 426,000, like I said, the bulk of it is going to um, upgrades and repairs on on the ventilation systems but so so let's using round numbers and school nutrition hopefully will be there on a regular basis because those are reimbursing us for indirect costs uh, so we've got 1.8 uh, plus um, plus the IVAC, mm -hmm. uh, so well, let's just round that for easy figuring to $2 million. Mm -hmm. uh, that's non-recurring. And so what people should understand that we may in the not, not that distant future have to come up with either $2 million worth of additional money or additional $2 million worth of cuts. Next slide, please on top of the uh, two point, uh, sorry, one more slide. Uh, so that 2.4 represents the number after offsets. Mm. If you take $2 million out of that, um, that means that number would be essentially 4.4, which is a huge number uh, for us to deal with 
not next year, but the following year. So this is a, uh, a very challenging situation uh, for the school committee and for administration, and I think people should understand that. We understand that 7.57% is a big increase, um, but what we want the public to understand is that it's being well spent on behalf of the children of Wareham. So we're trying to find the right balance between um, what we want to do for the children of Wareham and what the taxpayers can afford. And that's in essence uh, what the challenge for the school committee is. So thank you again for the clarity of your presentation. We appreciate it and uh, thanks. And you got us back on the agenda timeline, so nice go. job. <laughs> um, can I, can I yeah. ask a procedure Choice? question? So next, our next meeting is the budget hearing? Correct. Is that true? Okay. okay. Yes. So we will be, this is the presentation for Correct. that night also, okay. The public hearing. The public yes, hearing. public hearing, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Mr. Chair, can I encourage everybody who is listening or watching to please come mm -hmm. to the hearing. We would appreciate the opportunity to hear from, from voters, taxpayers, citizens, uh, your comments, your questions, and, con and consistent with the clarity that our administration has presented. We promise you honest answers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, number eight on the agenda is the superintendent's report uh, regarding gifts and bill and payroll warrants. I'll start with um, the gift. Um, a gift at the Wareham Elementary School of 80 homemade hats and mittens stuffed with school supplies. Wow. From the nitwits. <laughs> adorable <laughs> <laughs> and they will be given to our students who uh, really could use them Great. so thank you to the nitwits <laughs> with the K do we have a motion to accept that generous so gift second. second all in favor aye, aye. opposed New five zero zero thank you and um, in my newsletter, you saw the uh, payroll and bill warrants, um, and I ask that you um, approve those for payment. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Stay in five zero zero. Thank you very much, and that's all I have. So now the pressure to stay on timeline is all on April. So oh, April, take it away, please, with the mask <laughs> delegate report and the policies information for the committee. Thank okay. you. Okay, well, we know I talk fast, so this shouldn't be a problem. You guys just have to keep up. So um, as you know, I attended the MASC joint, uh, MASS joint conference um, at the beginning of November, and I was very happy to be the Wareham delegate for the resolutions committee. Um, I know that in a previous meeting we had gone through each of the resolutions and where we stood on them. Um, all of the resolutions at this year's conference passed. Um, there were a couple of small amendments to a couple of them, but it didn't change the structure of the resolutions. It was more um, some wording on a couple of um, spots on that. If you have any questions, I can tell you what they were or just let you know that they passed. Um, it is one of the most inspiring things to me to be in a room with those that many passionate people that are there for the kids and willing to you know, certain districts put themselves out there to bring forth some of these resolutions and try to get them to enact legislation that will help students statewide. So it, it's a really fantastic thing and I'm really proud to be a part of it on our behalf. Um, the second um, part is there was a lot of uh, amazing um, workshops that I was able to attend at the conference, um, and I can update anybody if they have any questions on those. One of them I briefed Joyce about, we were on the communication subcommittee, and I actually was in part of a workshop that came in very handy with the timeliness of that meeting. Um, 
there was a lot of um, just really great conversations about um, DEI and um, inclusivity. Um, you know, th and a lot of it was focused on the social and emotional healing still in the wake of um, the COVID pandemic and um, how that really has affected students in the long term and what we can do to not only support the students, but to support the staff in the districts as well, because it was, you know, everyone's focus is the students, but if the, st if the staff is suffering and they're the ones in front of the students as well, just encouraging support for them as well. Um, so that being said that on that, and then um, the policy subcommittee, um, did meet and going over a few um, policies for your attention. Um, the first one, if we go in the order that they're listed in our packet, um, is the, um, the transportation persons requiring medical attention. This was voted, um, there was no changes deemed necessary. So do we want to vote each policy, I believe at the end of each one. So there was no change to this. So I'll take a, a motion to approve the transportation of persons requiring medical attention. So moved. Second. Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero zero. Okay, so the next um, policy was the chargent student meals policy, and we asked that due to the fact that we are um, under a grant that provides all of our food for the students at no cost, that we temporarily suspend um, this policy uh, until, up until, or if the grant expires. So this would just, to suspend this, it wouldn't, take this grant away, it would just make it in, ineffective and, until the, um, the grant for the food service expires. So do we have a motion to temporarily suspend this policy? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero zero. Okay, so the next one is the staff ethics and conflict of interest policy. And this again was um, voted as no changes were deemed necessary. So we would just vote to um, keep this one as is as well. We have a motion to accept. Jeff, question? Uh, question for Dr. DeAndrea. To the best of your knowledge, is paragraph four uh, <laughs> true? I gotta find paragraph four. Yes, it's that's true. Thank you. Do we have a motion to accept? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero zero. Uh, the next one uh, policy would be for quarry requirements. Um, this again was just that we the only discussion we really had on this was to make sure that all of the MGL that was um, mentioned was up to date, and as that it was, there was a vote for no changes to this policy. Motion to accept. So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. <laughs> there you go. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero zero. Thank you. Okay. The next one is for standardized testing, and again, there was no change voted for this policy. The motion to accept. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero zero. Okay. The next one on this would be the residency policy, and this one again was voted with no changes. Motion to accept. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Oh, oh, do we, oh, okay, sorry, I thought you had a question. Oh, no. No, no. All in favor, aye. Aye. Five zero zero. Okay, so the, the last policy is the child custody and there should be a secondary document that was attached that highlights and um, has um, words stricken uh, to update that policy. It had pre to the changes would be beginning with the registration process. The school shall verify that each parent or guardian has legal custody of a child. And it's striking the last part of that statement um, that unless the school principal is provided with legal documentation indicating other circumstances. 
Dismissal of a child to an individual other than a parent or guardian will not be permitted unless a written notice of permission is provided by a parent or guardian having legal custody. A state issued photo identification of the individual be requested at the time of dismissal. And then we added the word guardian because that was missing uh, just to keep the language consistent and a parent or guardian claiming custody will be obligated to provide legal evidence to the school principal. Uh, and that was the changes that were proposed to that policy. Jeff, question? Yeah, Dr. Dandian, how yeah. typically does this a child's relationship to a parent or guardian get verified? That's my question. How does that happen? Yes. Um, so when the parent comes in to register the child. The very first time. Yes. Okay. They uh, are required to bring in a birth certificate. Okay. And we, we look to see that they are identified as one of the parents on the birth certificate. And if there's another parent involved, we take the word for the, other, for the parent that has verified the relationship. Is that a fair statement? Oh, I'm sorry, say that. So let's say the mother brings in the child. Yeah. They have a birth certificate. Right. And it's a member, that, per, that relationship is verified. Does it list right. both parents? I guess it does. It right? does, yeah. An, yeah. Okay. Um, so, and any change in the relationship between that child and the parents, like a divorce, yeah. okay? Is, is it up to the parents to notify the school of that change? Yes. If there is some sort of custody issue, yes, we need court documentation. And the same would be true for a guardian. They'd have Cor to show That's correct. That's correct. Associated with that guardianship. That's correct. And at the beginning of every school year, the parent has to resubmit information. Really? At the, at stu the first week of school, they're given a packet to bring home to parents to fill out that says custodial parent, are there any changes in the circumstances? You know, is there any court documentation? And you have to submit a copy of it if there is to the prospective school. So the principals have that in the student's file. And that gets submitted the first day of school, within the first couple of days. And then the only other situation I can imagine is a bus driver dropping off a kindergartner. And let, I mean, talk about a burden on the bus driver knowing that mm -hmm. the person who's walking up to the bus door is in fact the right person for that child. Mm -hmm. That just seems like A, it's a huge responsibility, and B, it would be easy to not know whether that parent was the right parent or that person was the right parent for that child and i can imagine some awkward moments at that mm -hmm. time um, it's the sister or it's the aunt or mm -hmm. it's the uh, okay thank you any other questions joyce i had the same question i'm not sure that I understand the answer, but I will just go with what, it. What, what? Well, because beginning with the registration process, the school shall verify that each parent has legal custody of a child. So if I come in with a birth certificate for my child, yeah. how do you know I have legal custody? We look to see that you're listed as the parent, mm -hmm. and then we ask you for your license. And that if that it's the same person listed on the birth certificate. I think what she's asking is how does a birth certificate prove chain of custody in like say a, a, so I, as a single parent when I first registered Dylan in Wareham Public Schools at the time I had an active restraining order against his father. Mm -hmm. So I had to come into the registration with that court document of who was allowed to pick up my child, who was allowed to be near him, and I had to have photo IDs, I had to provide a photo of his father, like all kinds of documentation when I first registered him for school. But, but how do you prove that you had legal custody? I had a document from the court that said that I was a stole, sole physical I'm custodian. I'm just getting wrapped up in the details, I, I, so I, I, I will just obviously. I think it's a case, right. in those extenuating circumstances. I don't know how, how we, what else we could do beyond that. Right, right. It's not no. a trivial thing. Right. I'm sympathetic. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right, I, yeah. So that, I'm satisfied yeah. with that answer, thank you. <laughs> Do I have a motion to accept that policy? So moved. Second. Second. Brandon got it first. 
<laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Five zero zero. April, nicely See, done. See, I told Very you timely. I would get through <laughs> it quickly. Thank you, April. Uh, next up, we have public participation. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing no, well, I'm not saying that. I mean, anyone want to address the committee? Okay, thank you. And any other business? Hearing none, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving and comes to the Bourne Wareham game or the Powder Puff game or both next week. Thank you very much, everybody. Meeting is adjourned.